previously on a body in progress. The blue herded those into the lawn, and I lined them, that goes along. Yeah, really. Got me... Which, I guess, wraps up the second section of a workout journal episode, the the fitness-related non-workout. So we've got, we've got the workout montage, and then we have other stuff that relates to getting in shape, but isn't, isn't uh, expressly workouts, per se. There's usually a section where I include some family or personal events just because. I don't know why. Uh, I don't know if it's because it helps make me a relatable human being to you. I doubt it. That sounds like way too much thought. I think maybe it's because I I appreciate having viewers. And I just kind of, in, in a way, even though many of you are completely faceless to me. I have 124 subscribers on YouTube and easily 40 or 50 of them, I don't even know who they are. But I still just view my subscribers and anyone who watches this series anywhere they find it, however it is you see it, there's a sense in which you're my friends. We, we, you're watching because of fitness, I'm presenting because of fitness, we have this one mutual interest at least, and there's a part of me that just says, and here, you know, share with them, here, here's what went on Here's what else went on in my life at that time, if it's important to me, and if I think it, it can be in any way entertaining to you, any way at all. Now, we've already spent a ton of time on this subject. As I record this, I have no idea what part we're in, part three, part four of, of behind the scenes. So I'm just going to race through some things that, if this were its own 20-minute workout journal episode, things that I might mention to you. I have footage from my very first hike for the year, April 1st, which I think is setting a record for how early I've gone for my first hike. It was a nice afternoon. It wasn't hot, but the weather was enjoyable, so my whole family went to this short hike called the Weiches Creek Overlook with a beautiful view. I am still planning to create a series of episodes about my hiking adventures, so I won't go into detail here, or, or I wouldn't, even if this were uh, specifically a, a, an isolated workout journal entry. There was the usual decorating of Easter eggs on Saturday before Easter, and then the hunting for them on Easter Sunday, and then the Easter meal where I ate way too many mashed potatoes and set my uh, weight goal back a few pounds. My wife spent much of her life in a town near Holland, Michigan, and Holland, Michigan is famous for its annual tulip festival. So when I discovered that Oregon has an annual tulip festival, uh, this year I took her to that. Just uh, just beautiful. I'm, I'm not into flowers, but so many bright colors and so many of them in, 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 in so many rows. It was huge. Uh, that really actually was... Uh, I, I, I did it for her, but I enjoyed myself. This was also the year for baby birds on our property. We have a birdhouse where birds annually make nests and we hear the baby birds, but then we never see them. I, I don't know if the blue jays eat them or they fly off when we're not looking, but this year, uh, one of the baby birds landed and uh, wasn't ready to take off and fly for quite a while. So I was able to get up close with the camera and even touch him. Oh, he was so cute. I would have tried to pick him up, except I have a feeling he would have started pecking if I had done that. We also had a baby robin we discovered over by one corner of our property. Don't know where he came from. He was also adorable. So yeah, this was, uh, for, for my daughters who love animals, this was, uh, this was quite the summer. This was, this was a, uh, this was a smorgasbord <laughs> of, of creatures. Only two of them, really. Uh, two baby birds spread out over a month's time, but that's two more than, than we've ever had on our property. Both my girls were absolutely giddy. 
July 4th, we had our annual Independence Day Parade, and I think I've said this before, but I love living in Redmond. It still has a small town feel, uh, and the, uh, the annual parade is just very enjoyable. And then there was the fireworks display in the evening. On July 28th, we went to the fair, and it was my daughter's first year as a 4-H participant. She took the uh, rabbit that we found uh, just roaming around and captured, and we tried to find the original owner, and nobody ever responded to Craigslist or posters or anything like that, so she became the owner, she took him to the fair, and he earned a blue ribbon. She did not for her presentation. Uh, she needs a little more experience on how you properly present a rabbit to the judge and answer the judge's questions. But the rabbit himself was considered uh, very high quality. So yeah, blue ribbon just for stumbling across an animal. And then on August 14th, we had our annual uh, neighborhood barbecue where we just invite everyone we know. And despite that being a couple hundred people every year, we only get a couple dozen, but you know what, we have a good time anyway, and the people who come uh, are always very enjoyable company. If we only had 20 minutes, most of that would probably not have made the list, but uh, that's just an idea of, of my gathering footage throughout the year, and that actually just goes in another folder. It's, it's a family folder. It's for personal memories and, and viewing later. But when I'm creating a workout journal entry, I do go through uh, the, the family files for the dates in question, and see, is there anything there that I would want to mention in the main, in, in the fitness episode, in the workout journal? One other key element of many workout journals, and usually the last part of the episode, is my evaluation of my weight. And so let's go ahead and take a look at what happens there. Of course, you know I, I step on the scale quite regularly. And I have a spreadsheet on Google Docs on their spreadsheet function where I keep track of those weigh-ins. Um, I've mentioned it before, and now I'm going to reveal to you just how nerdy this gets. The first column is a countdown from day one, so 365 down to one. The next is uh, the day and the date, so those three columns. And then the fourth column is the actual weight. I don't always actually remember to weigh in every single day. Sometimes I have to get up early and get on with a project. Sometimes I get up casually, normally, but then I eat breakfast and remember afterwards that I didn't weigh in and now the food in my stomach would skew the weight and so I'll just save it for tomorrow. So in the fifth column, if it's a day where I don't have an official weight on the scale, I put an E and that stands for extrapolate. And what that means is I will fill that in later because I don't want a blank in the fourth column. I want a number in every slot. So if I miss a day, I put an E. And so, for example, if on Monday I weigh in and I forget on Tuesday and I weigh in on Wednesday, then I do the math to see what the weight is exactly between the two on Monday and Wednesday. Column six is a seven-day rolling average, and what that does is it smooths out the jagged and sudden ups and downs of the raw weight. It gives a better impression of the overall direction that we're going. So you see, for example, uh, let's take a look here at uh, the, the, the end of April and the start of May. There are a few ups and downs here. They're very sudden and they're very sharp. But the rolling average just kind of smooths that out and says, well, overall, you were going downhill. You were losing weight. Column 7 is set up to trigger the word lower or no, depending on whether or not my rolling average was lower than it had been at any time previous in the year. And I, that's, yeah, that took a while to figure out. It's a complicated formula, and I'm not going to bore you with it here. But anyway, uh, the next column shows whether the rolling average, or shows how much the rolling average has gone up or down since the previous day. Next to that is the column I call my pace car. The first entry is my weight on January 1st, and then it is broken down, it is divided into 365 parts to, to show how much I should weigh on the next day in order to hit 200 by the end of the year. Now, in 2021, I was... On my pace car, I was doing well all the way through um, uh, January 30th. I was ahead of my pace car. And then I fell behind a couple times. And then by the end of February, I had fallen behind for what would end up being uh, the rest of the year. I never again caught up with what that number wanted me to be. 
And the last column simply shows the difference between my actual weight and where the pace car says I should be. And anytime that was a negative number, uh, that was a good thing. In terms of my weight, 2021 was basically a non-year. I started in the mid-220s, and I ended in the mid-220s. I went up and down a lot. I bounced all over that chart, uh, always within the 220s. dipped a little bit into the high 210s, but um, it wasn't a net loss. In fact, it was a net gain. I ended about a pound, I think, heavier. I wanted to go down. In 2019, from the start to the finish, I went down. 2020, start to finish, I went down. 2021, start to finish, I went up a little bit. So in 2022, I have some work to do to finally, finally hit 200 and get that particular goal off my list before some people I know um, just throw up their hands and walk away in frustration. <laughs> I go over all of that material again and again, pulling out parts that I feel perhaps are too slow or it's just too much information. I, I talked way too long and you don't need to hear all of that with the aim of bringing it down to 20 minutes. 20 minutes grew out of the previous years of experience where I didn't really have a time limit of any kind and my episode lengths were wildly different. In the early years, I had one that was three minutes long and another one that was 30 minutes long. And there was, there, there, was no, um, there was no personal restriction. If I wanted to say it, I said it. And that resulted in some videos where I just talked a lot. And so, as I was starting this series... I wanted more of a uniform length. I settled on 20 minutes, one, for uniformity, and two, because that seemed to be a good length for me to present whatever the topic was, whatever the theme was, but also to prevent me from rambling about it. It forces me, because I, I almost always over-talk. I almost always present way too much information and use too many words to do it. So it forces me to go in and say, I don't need that whole paragraph there. I don't need that whole thing there. And then once I've taken out the big blocks, I see it's it's still 23 minutes. I can trim I can trim the workout section by 30 seconds. I can throw I, I, I don't need that. I don't need that. And you know I slowly eke this thing down until it's 20 minutes or less. Um, and then if it is less, I, I try to expand it a little bit because, just just roll with this. I'm not officially OCD, but I have a I have a, a sense of a desire for a certain precision that I discovered before I was even a teenager. I remember once watching a movie. We had rented a movie. We were watching it at home, and the the box for the video cassette, 1980s, said it was something like 91 minutes. And out of dumb curiosity, I actually watched the movie with a stopwatch. And it turned out to be 90 and a half minutes. And to me, that was not 91 minutes. I grew up then with this desire, with this 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 burning passion in my head that whenever it was my turn to finally make a movie, it would be precise. It would be precise to the minute. Not 90 and a half, not 90 and 45 seconds, either 90 minutes or 91 or 92 or 93. No extra seconds. And so when I started this video series, knowing that it's mine to do with as I please, I decided on 20 minutes. Exactly 20 minutes. 20 minutes, zero seconds, zero frames. All of my files for all of the previous 50 episodes, when you open up the data and you look at them, say exactly 20 minutes, not even a fraction of a second longer. 
that may disturb some of you, and uh, you're absolutely correct. The last part of the editing that I will mention, and you have seen it in, I think, every episode, is one of the tools I use to go in and remove parts of the episode that I don't want, especially parts of me talking too much or making mistakes and having to go back, and that is the little white flash. Every time you see a little white flash, one of two things has happened. I have come to the end of a thought, and there's a long pause while I go through my notes and figure out what I want to say next, and then I start up again. And so that white flash is covering me, taking out the pause. Or I've gotten halfway through a paragraph and messed up and have to start again. And so the little white flash takes all that out. I guess there, there is a third one, and that is where I've got a long section of dialogue, but I don't want the sentence in the middle. So I cut here, and I cut there, I pull that out, I put them together, and I put the little white flash. Some people out there, some YouTube channels, specialize in what I call the sudden cuts method. That's the method where the narrator kind of bounces around from idea to idea and just cuts them all together. He just rams them together with no grace, no dignity whatsoever. I am not a fan of this form of editing. Once in a very odd while, it it fits the occasion. But most of the time that I see it being used on YouTube videos, it is just, uh, it is just sloppy. It means the person hosting the video doesn't really even have to think about anything more than one sentence at a time. Sometimes they cut right in the middle of a sentence. I've seen some where they actually chop it up into individual words, and I just don't get that. I would much rather know what I'm talking about and be able to just look at the camera and express what I want to express to you. If I have to, if, if, if I can't form a thought longer than one sentence at a time, then I don't know my subject well enough. I don't know what I want to tell you well enough. So yeah, I, I use the little white flashes and even then you will sometimes see the little white flash chopping it up into pretty short segments. And um, usually when that happens, it, it really is just a time constraint. It doesn't represent moronic levels of intelligence. The very last thing I do, and my least favorite part of the whole process, is I mix the audio. I try to make sure that my voice is not too loud at any given point, or too soft, that the music is an appropriate level, especially if I'm also talking at the same time, um, that, that everything just sounds good or, or as good as I can make it. Um, if there is any part of video production that I could farm out to someone else or could afford to have pay someone else to do, it would be the final audio mix. Once I am absolutely certain that the video is ready to present to the public, or even if I think it's absolutely certain but I haven't noticed a misspelling or some other error which occasionally happens. Yes, on the YouTube uploads of these, there are some mistakes and it just bothers me to no end. But once I think the video is ready to go, I export it, convert it to a file that YouTube can read, upload it to YouTube, and share it with the world. Thank you for wading through all of this mess with me. Thank you for indulging me with my greatest passion in life, film production. Hopefully someday you will go to a movie theater and you will see the title of the movie, who's in it, who did the costumes, who did the editing, who did the music, and the very last thing before the story begins, you will see directed by Brian Johnson. Thank you.